Hi, hobby friends. What if Eldrad was a necromancer? I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? He's big into the idea of resurrecting a god of death at any rate. So, after a two-week whirlwind job completing this enormous Harlequin army, check the link in the corner there for how to do those guys, it's time to slow all the way down and spend a few days on just one guy. And while we do that, you'll get to see some practical applications of lighting effects and colour theory. Nice. First things first, let's talk about colours. A cursory check of my own mental catalogue and a whiz through ArtStation and Google Image Search gives plenty of results for lurid green and royal purple under the necromancer category. I am more than happy to play into the tropes on this one, so let's go with that. You'll notice that I'm not putting a purple paint on the palette though. Instead, what we've got is a rich blue and the mighty magic quinacridone magenta. If we take a look at the colour wheel quickly, we can see that magenta and blue straddle purple nicely. By prepping the analogous colours, I'm both giving myself a little more freedom when mixing down colours for other areas, and giving myself the full range of hues to use on the purpley bits. This works best when you're working with high quality paints with no sneaky white additions or other shenanigans. That way you can better predict what your mixes are going to look like. Filling out the palette, there are a pretty lurid lime green, a nice chilled turquoise, and the outlier, some yellow oxide. This paint not only fills out the warm side of the colour wheel for us, it's also a lot muddier, meaning less saturated and a little more complex than our other paints. That's going to be handy for bringing down the overall intensity of the scheme. Between the turquoise, magenta and yellow, we have a kind of sort of triadic palette going on, giving us a big wide gamut to mess with. Almost like I planned it, huh? The last paints are good old Titanium White and Payne's Grey, which is like a black paint but one that doesn't flatten colours out too much when mixed. And that's it. Apart from a special guest appearance later and some true metallic metal offerings for the trim, that's all the paints I'm using for this scheme. As you can imagine, that means a lot of mixing to get everything that we want, and we've dived right into that with these bases here, mixing out some bluish greys and cool muddy greens to coat the stone and skulls respectively. Now let's do that cloak next, starting with a really rich blue-purple base. The thought process here when mixing this colour, and basically all the other colours, follows the logic implicit in my colour terms video. See the link in the description for that one. What I mean by that is, first we aim to get ourselves to the right hue, then we can optionally adjust our saturation by adding in our hue's complementary colour, and then we mess with the value by adding in black or white. It's an art, not a science, and there's more to explore in a dedicated video, but that's the approach I use, and hopefully that whets your appetite for the colour theory content I have already on the channel, and the stuff that I have planned for the future. While the cloak dries, let's get those skulls looking a bit more bonish by slowly adding more and more yellow and eventually white to our greenish base, and layering that up in big, broad, overbrush type applications. Dense clusters of relatively detailed stuff like this can be a bit intimidating, but you can always approach it as a single object with texture. After that's done, you can go in and refine the individual elements later, but this time I know there's a big step coming that will change everything here, so I'm happy to leave it pretty rough this time. Okay, the cloak is dry, let's get back to that now, starting with a significantly warmer purple. Warmer in this case just means more magenta, since that's the colour that is closer to the warm side of the colour wheel relative to our starting blue purple. Nothing too complicated with the application here, I'm just layering it on. When that's done, we can continue our progression by adding more magenta and layering up again, and then eventually some of that yellow oxide too. By adding in a high value colour instead of plain old white, we avoid slipping into pinks for our highlights, and we keep the progression moving in a warm direction. Titanium white is a cool colour. 
This is a really vital piece of information that gets skipped over sometimes in mini painting. That's the real reason you hear so many people recommending pale sand or a similar yellowish off-white as a highlight mixer. Keeping things warm and with a little color in them keeps your highlights vibrant. It's a similar idea for highlighting the tabard cum cummerband Eldrad is sporting, except this time, instead of going anti-clockwise around the wheel, we're going clockwise using that vivid lime green instead of the earthy yellow oxide. And who's afraid of a little texture, eh? Why not get stipply with this one? The rune armor gets the same treatment as the skulls, so building up from a very dark grey green to a typical desaturated bone white, and then it's time to tackle the various pouches and satchels our old elf buddy here carries around with him. Now it's very tempting to break out any old brown paint here and go to town, but where's the fun in that? And anyway, we do run the risk of upsetting our colour balance that way if we use a brown that doesn't mesh with everything else that's going on. So let's just make our own. Brown is a fancy word for desaturated orange and we can get to an orange-ish colour with that magenta and yellow we have. Throw in some of that Payne's Grey which has a bluish quality to it and we get a 2 for 1 desaturation and value decrease. It might not look like much on the palette, but in context, on the mini and with some judicious highlights made with mixing in more of that yellow oxide, we get a nice muted brown that sits well in the rest of the scheme. Metallics now. When we reach for the metallic paints, it's easy to switch off the colour part of the brain and just go, make it shiny. But if we really want consistency over the whole scheme, it's good to keep engaged with our hues. So over an initial coat of decayed metal from scale 75, I'm going in with a big and bold Garnet Alchemy, a rosy pink copperish tone. Once again, on the plain white palette there, the garnet looks pretty outlandish, but among that purpley loveliness on Eldrad, it feels right at home. A fine example of colour relativity. The blacks were highlighted with a turquoise-ish grey, and I finally decided what I wanted to do with the end of Eldrad's staff, so better get that all done as well. Stick on his head and look at that, he's really coming together. A few more highlights and texture here and there, and we ended up with this. But this isn't the end of the video. Oh no, I promised some lighting effects, and anyway, I clearly haven't touched those gems. So, enough gawking at this version of the mini, let's get lighting. Step 1. Get rid of some of the light. This lighting stage isn't just about adding big bold colours, it's about sculpting out the whole mini, and filtering over this very transparent muted grey ink will boost up shadows on this side. That's boosted our general shadow situation, but now we need to get some colour in there, and since the plan is to go lurid green on the lighting from this bottom right corner, I'm going in with this cool green as a general fill. It's important to note that I'm still, in a sense, working on the shadows here, not the light. We started with a bunch of local colours, that is, the natural colour of the object under a relatively plain lighting situation. By adding transparent filters of paint to that, we will always darken the overall colour. But that's okay, because this stage is all about filling in the bounce light that sneaks around corners and into shadows. We're greening up the whole area before adding in our real light. I'll take this opportunity to mention that hitting the like and sub button helps the channel immensely, and if you want to support the channel even more, you can keep me stocked up with paints and gear with a one-off super like donation, or by joining these superior specimens scrolling by, by following the link to my Patreon in the description below. Okay, back to the light. The first thing we need to do is really bring up the value a lot. What I'm doing here is mixing a super liquidy but still highly pigmented wash. It's just white ink and airbrush thinner, and when we have a good wet consistency, I load my brush up and get to work wicking that off into the recesses of the skulls. When that's good and dry, and bear in mind it might take a couple of layers in your brightest spots depending on how thin the wash was, it's time for that special guest paint, fluorescent green. This gets applied in the same way as the white, 
pooling in all those gaps and giving us the effulgent ectoplasmic feel I've been hankering after. We can go further with the intensity though, so let's do another pass of the white, this time being a little more particular about where the paint pools, namely in the deepest recesses. And over that white application, I filtered some yellow fluorescent paint. It's fairly subtle, but the extra layer of brightness really helps sell the effect. Now, I felt like we'd lost some of the bony character of the Skullnado at this point, so I went in and dry brushed that bone progression that I've been working with. I didn't get the actual dry brushing on camera, but this is the end result. I also did a really gentle pass of the fluoro green through my airbrush to amp up the light hitting Eldrad himself. Alright, last but by no means least, it's back to the brush to add those little glints of light and those all-important value-boosting glazes to wherever our green light source would reach. This is the stage that really lifts OSL from okay looking to good looking. Take your time and importantly, think about your materials. All Eldrad's bling will catch the light more obviously than his matte and dark clothing, so add some specular dots of light there too. Okay, let's take a look at the final results now. Skuldrad Skullthran himself, raising the dead one bone at a time. My long-suffering camera did not take so well to the fluoro paints, so the skull's lighting effect is a little blown out here, but hopefully you still get the general idea. A super fun project that I think turned out pretty well in the end. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the down below and I will see you next time.